Here's Why We Get Sick, uh, The New Science of Darwinian Medicine by Randolph Nessie and George Williams. Um, Nessie was at Michigan when we were at Michigan. We actually did, as I remember, we did like a semester long seminar in Darwinian medicine with him. Yep. Um, and we and, knew George Williams before his death. Yep. And George Williams is one of the, the great evolutionary biologists of the 20th century. And um, and this book is is critical. This, you know, again, it's called Why We Get Sick, The New Science of Darwinian Medicine. It is the best there is on this topic. And it was published in 1994. It was published 29 years ago. And there is not another book that has <clears throat> that has come in and uh, and continued the conversation. And so um, Nessie is actually an MD, and George Williams is a PhD in biology or evolutionary biology. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, they they argue correctly um, early to the game uh, that medicine, in order to actually be good at treating people, needs to take an evolutionary approach in all things, not just to the human body, but to the interaction of the human body with pathogens, to the arms races that happen between them, to which diseases that we experience are about mismatches with our current environment because of hypernovelty, the term that we we um, coined. coined in Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, which of them are actually about trade-offs, they're intrinsic to our system, and we ought to choose A or B, and neither of them are great, but you're going to be stuck with the trade-off. Like, there, there are different ways that our bodies do fail us, and some of them are avoidable, and some of them aren't, but they can be mitigated. And this is this book does a fantastic job of describing some of that. So I just want to read a, a brief excerpt. Again, this is a book published 29 years ago, still the best treatise on the topic of Darwinian medicine, as far as as far as I'm aware. So from late in the book, page 236, we have this. <clears throat> Why isn't the, this is at the near the end of the book in which they've already laid out argument after argument, example after example. Why isn't the body more reliable? Why is there disease at all? As we have seen, the reasons are remarkably few. First, there are genes that make us vulnerable to disease. Some, though fewer than has been thought, are defectives continually arising from new mutations but kept scarce by natural selection. Other genes cannot be eliminated because they cause no disadvantages until it is too late in life for them to affect fitness. Antagonistic pleiotropy, as Brett, you have uh, written about in your work on telomeres, cancer, and senescence. Most deleterious genetic effects, however, are actively maintained by selection because they have unappreciated benefits that outweigh their costs. Some of these are maintained because of heterozygote advantage. Some are selected because they increase their own frequency, despite creating a disadvantage for the individual who bears them. Some are genetic quirks that have adverse effects only when they interact with a novel environmental factor. Second, disease results from exposure to novel factors that were not present in the environment in which we evolved. Given enough time, the body can adapt to almost anything, but the 10,000 years since the beginnings of civilization are not nearly enough time and we suffer accordingly. Infectious agents evolve so fast that our defenses are always a step behind. Third, disease results from design compromises, such as upright posture with its associated back problems. Fourth, we are not the only species with adaptations produced and maintained by natural selection, which works just as hard for pathogens trying to eat us and the organisms we want to eat. In conflict with these organisms, as in baseball, you can't win them all. Finally, disease results from unfortunate historical legacies. If the organism had been designed with the possibility of fresh starts and major changes, there would be better ways of preventing many diseases. Alas, every successive generation of the human body must function well, with no chance to go back and start afresh. This is a, a sort of an opaque reference to adaptive landscapes. Finally, the human body turns out to be both fragile and robust. Like all products of organic evolution, it is a bundle of compromises, each of which offers an advantage, but often at the price of susceptibility to disease. These susceptibilities cannot be eliminated by any duration of natural selection, for it is the very power of natural selection that created them. That's the sentence that I wanted to get to here. You will find, go into any scientific paper or medical paper right now, go onto Twitter and find the, the medical professionals and researchers talking about, they've got the breakthrough, they're going to cure cancer, they're going to cure aging, they've got the vaccine that's going to stop everything in its tracks, and see how hubristic they are and how the, the failure to understand that natural selection got us there and it's still working and it's going to continue to to move forward in time as with regardless of what we throw at it 
that you know this this assumption of a, st a stable background onto which we can apply our treatments is not just arrogant but incredibly weak-minded like it, it really misunderstands the landscape that we're in as an evolved and evolving landscape yeah it um the medical approach in isolation of an evolutionary understanding results in us being upended again and again by our failure to appreciate the complexity of the system which we are very unlikely to improve upon right? We can do certain things. Right. Our right. best tricks are borrowed from evolution itself, right? Antibiotics are miraculous, but we don't make them. Those mm -hmm. antibiotics come from chemical warfare between bacteria and fungi, right? And we borrow them. Surgery, marvelous, but surgery doesn't work on your car. Why not? Because it is entirely contingent on the ability of the body to fix itself after you slice it open and pull something out or modify something. So, you know, it is a recognition of the complexity of the system and the um, the nature of the ratio that makes you far more likely to screw the thing up than than improve upon it. That is the basis of the correct thinking, and the uh, this is now uh, flipping that order on its head. Right? Exactly. Let me just just because you because you just went there. Yep. One more little excerpt this time from our book, A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the Twenty First Century, in which we devote one two-ish, but really, you know, one chapter to medicine and another to sort of the human body and form and function more generally, um, we say in the chapter on medicine, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, said biologist Theodosius Dobchansky. This is famous. Uh, it, you know, that, that quote shows up in Why We Get Sick in most books that talk about evolution at all. So that's Dobch Dobchansky from 1963. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. We write, medicine is biological at its heart. That does not mean, though, that most medical research being done is evolutionary in its thinking or in the questions being asked. Combine a tendency to engage only proximate questions with a bias towards reductionism, and you end up with medicine that has blinders on. The view is narrow. Even the great victories of Western medicine, surgery, antibiotics, and vaccines, have been over-extrapolated, applied in many cases where they shouldn't be. When all you have is a knife, a pill, and a shot... The whole world looks as though it would benefit from being cut and medicated. And just a reminder that we actually uh, submitted the first draft of this book, and that chapter didn't change much um, just before COVID was hitting, just before lockdowns uh, in early March of 2020. That was written before COVID, and uh, and yeah, it's it's still true. 